what is the theoretically fastest way that you could get from LA to San Francisco? For Reason TV, I'm Justin Monticello. I'm here today with Dirk Alborn, who's the CEO and co-founder of Jumpstart Fund and also the CEO of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. Dirk, thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. Elon Musk of SpaceX and Tesla and PayPal introduced this idea of a Hyperloop in 2012. It's it's cost me a Concorde, a railgun, and an air hockey table. Can you just give us an explanation of what the Hyperloop is? So imagine a capsule with 28 people that's hovering inside a tube at really high speeds of 760 miles per hour. It's completely solar powered. It's cheaper to be built. It's earthquake stable. It can never crash. Um, it is immune to weather. The Hyperloop would go effectively faster than the speed of sound. You could conceivably live in San Francisco and work in LA. What's the difference between a Hyperloop and, let's say, a, a maglev train like those in Japan that ride on magnets? The propulsion and levitation is, uh, you know, there's different ways in which you can do it. The original Hyperloop uh, proposal was talking about air skis. Meter and a half long paddles that use the air around them to create pressurized cushions of air on which the pod can ride. Like, like an air hockey table. I mean, it would be smooth as glass. The real difference is actually in the tube. So with a Hyperloop, you have a low pressure environment. So it's very similar to when an airplane is really high. Um, it doesn't encounter a lot of resistance. And then you have in front of the capsule a compressor that takes away the air so the remaining resistance moves us to the back so that basically the capsule, it doesn't touch anywhere, it doesn't have resistance in the front, and it can just hover with little energy and reach those top speeds at 760 miles per hour. And in terms of within cities themselves, do you think it could revolutionize shorter transportation as well? If you get from LA to San Francisco in 34, 34 35 minutes, which is more or less what we have planned right now with the Hyperloop, that's awesome. But if it takes you an hour and a half to get to the station, we haven't really solved the problem. So what we, really, what we are really working on is um, to create a way where you just take out your phone, you push a button, and let's say within 50 minutes you are in San Francisco. So a self-driving car comes, picks you up, brings you to the local Hyperloop station, so a mini loop inside the city that then takes you to the larger station, which takes you up to San Francisco. So it has to be an integrated system. It has to be something that you use every day several times. That's really when we change the way people live. So he initially proposed this as a response to California's plans to build a high-speed rail. It has the dubious distinction of being the slowest bullet train um, <laughs> and the most expensive per mile. Um, <laughs> Go California. <laughs> So can you kind of give us an idea of the major differences between this project versus a rail system? Um, they're way slower than we would be and way more expensive. So most high-speed rail projects uh, actually do not make money. Our whole concept is based on the fact that this is a business, it's a venture. Um, we don't rely on public funding necessarily. In dollar amounts, what, do you, what would you be looking at for a Hyperloop from LA to San Francisco versus you know, a rail system? 10 to 20 percent. So we are, we are looking at 16 billion dollars. But again, I actually personally believe it will be much less than that with a ticket price of uh, approximate 30 dollars. How does the environmental impact compare? Hyperloop has no environmental impact, if you want. So it's completely self-powered. We very likely actually will produce energy. The Hyperloop is um, on pylons, so we are taking way less land. Where you can, you would use publicly available right-of-way, like, uh, like the I-5. We don't have to go through fields like a highway or a rail. I talked a little bit at the beginning about Jumpstart Fund. So this is a, a company or a platform that you started in 2013 that is supposed to enable better crowdsourcing. So can you explain to us how how it works and how... Yes, sure. Works. So we're trying to mix open source methods with a commercial company here. Having 500,000 people that are helping you to make your entrepreneurial project a success, you can build a better company. So in, in the case of the Hyperloop, what we did is we saw that there was a huge interest from people um, to actually make this happen and be part of it. So uh, we opened up the company. We're collaborating with uh, Supra Studios at UCLA and a lot of really amazing people. So from a 
Stanford uh, psychology professor to a guy that helped build the Mars rover, then working with the community, so with the general public and the community on the side to get more insights. We have 10% uh, of the future revenues that are reserved to the community. And how is this approach to creating this project different from the way that the California government has approached the high-speed rail project? You know, normally these projects are, you know, decided somewhere in a boardroom, built, and then something's wrong or something doesn't really work the way it is, or you don't have so many people as you saw that are actually going to use it. So this is the first time that a project of this size has ever been done like this. So we are trying to work with the public completely in an open way. We want to show how the interior of the capsule is going to look like, how is it going to feel. Um, we are asking people to come up with ideas on how we can reduce uh, the ticket price, um, come up with our business model. I'm actually just, I'm the CEO because someone has to be the CEO, but we are a crowd-powered company. So. <laughs> Actually, when, when we started, I met uh, Tim Draper, the venture capitalist. He told me, man, that's amazing. If you guys are successful, what do we have governments for? Are you looking at the regulatory side now, or are you focused we, we on actually, that? We're actually not trying to get distracted too much, because if we can't build it, then there is no reason to think about the politics. At what point in the process of developing this are you right now? Elon Musk announced that he will be building a test track in Texas, it will be a small scale version. That's great for us because we can test parts of our systems out there. But to really being able to build LA to San Francisco, we have to do a full scale version okay. that people are using where we can you know, optimize everything. Today announcing a deal struck with the developers in Quay Valley, California, Carl, where they will build a five mile stretch of their version of the Hyperloop. You're starting construction next year, right? On an actually fully functional urban version of the Hyperloop? We are doing a public offering um, that's scheduled for the end of the year, uh, where we will raise the funds needed in order to build the first project. We hope we can get this done by 2018. What do you think are the biggest hurdles that you're going to face? People are afraid of new technologies. They don't understand it. I think it's going to do the same thing that the rail actually did to America when, when it first got introduced in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. you know, and obviously, the naysayers are very similar. So a lot of people at that time were thinking that you would die when you go on a train because it goes so fast you couldn't breathe. So once you're starting to build and people can actually try it out, I don't, uh, I don't think anything can stop it. All right, Dirk Goldborn. All right, thank thank you. you for speaking with me. Thank you for having me. Thank you.